much. It is indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Um, I'm not going to have time to explain all the gaps in the Law of the Sea Convention, but I will at least bring the, the good news that we have many of the tools and technologies that we need to address some of these gaps and weaknesses. We have scientific tools like this animation here that can track sea turtle, loggerhead sea turtles, and they move across the Pacific Ocean based on sea surface temperature changes. They're using this now in the United States um, as part of a program to limit bycatch of highly endangered loggerhead sea turtles. That's, it's where you have an, a law, a binding law, where the fishers know if they exceed their bycatch quota, the entire fishery closes, that you can actually make progress. You can do this in areas within national jurisdiction, but at present, we don't have the tools we need in order to do this beyond national jurisdiction. I'm learning to use this tool here. As someone said, you have to hold it right side up or upside down. There we go, okay. Um, it's the end one, not the middle one. Uh, that's, so this is my list of some of the strengths of the Law of the Sea Convention. It's good to start with things we can build on. That's, it has clearly defined rights as well as duties, rights for freedom of fishing, uh, freedom of navigation. These are very important for commercial purposes. But at the same time, they are balanced and couched in the context of the obligation to protect and preserve the marine environment to address all forms of marine pollution, a very big problem at the time UNCLOSE was negotiated, to conduct prior impact assessments and to report on them publicly, and to cooperate on a global and regional basis to develop new rules to protect and preserve the marine environment. At the same time, we're confronted by numerous weaknesses in areas beyond national jurisdiction that hamper our effective um, appliance implementation of these rules. For example, very few incentives for compliance. There's no uh, rote uh, list of flag state obligations. There's no mention of concepts of marine biodiversity. They were not informed or advised by Elliot Norris at the time of the importance of preserving the full array of species, ecosystems, and genetic diversity. There's no mention of the term precaution though it did appear in the 1995 implementing agreement to the Law of the Sea Convention for highly migratory and straddling fish stocks. There's no provisions for protected areas. And of course, there's no global rules for environmental impact assessments, so there are for a very few sector-based activities. And of course, there's fragmentary regional cooperation. So what do we need? That's, this is my favorite guy. Uh, so to some people, he's a bandit. To some people, he's a law keeper. But when Eleanor Ostrom was developing her rules for how do you manage a commons effectively, she said it is possible. We are not doomed or destined to a tragedy of the commons. But where you have situations of shared responsibility between the community, where you can limit access to those who are willing to play by the rules, and of course you can trust, but you also need to be able to verify. So how do we turn this bandit into a sheriff? that uh, we don't need lots of law enforcement vehicles out there, but we do need common goals, responsibilities, and principles to guide all states, all sectoral organizations, and all global organizations as they develop their own policies. And these include what we agreed at Rio just a year ago this month, is to protect the health, resilience, and productivity of the oceans, to maintain their biodiversity, and to apply the ecosystem approach and the precautionary approach in so doing. So how do we operationalize these for the nearly 50% of the planet that lies beyond national jurisdiction? That's, well, we need a specific mandate in a legally binding agreement for organizations, the regional fisheries management organizations, the International Seabed Authority, to cooperate in the development of systematically planned marine protected area networks. It's not enough to just designate one area at a time because you may be missing the important breeding ground for, another, for a species that you're protecting their feeding ground. So it needs to be conducted with the best available scientific information and tools we have to hand. 
we also need to modernize and upgrade our system of regional oceans management um, organizations. This is a map of the regional seas conventions and action plans. Uh, that's, um, Jackie Alder will correct some of the boundaries at some point, but we need to be correcting these boundaries. There's only four that have any mandate in areas beyond national jurisdiction. They may have responsibility for the species that transcend these boundaries, but they've only focused in internally waters at best. Where we have seen high seas marine protected areas being established in the Northeast Atlantic, in the Southern Ocean, and the Mediterranean, you have an effective and functioning regional seas organization and an effective and functioning regional fisheries management organization. We need to upgrade both. Thus, we also need to be able to condition access to those willing to play by the rules. As a first step to doing so is we have a tool commonly applied within national jurisdiction, environmental impact assessments that's, um, that are able in some cases to address, to assess also cumulative impact assessments. A newer tool are strategic environmental assessments, which allow us to extrapolate what impact our policies, plans, programs, and even new technologies may have in the wider marine environment. But to date, we have nothing that actually requires these to be um, implemented and any procedure to actually give these any teeth. We do have an example, a precedent of where this has been applied. We've heard discussion of it already today with respect to deep sea bottom fishing in the high seas, where the United Nations General Assembly adopted a series of resolutions, first one in 2006, calling on states and regional fisheries management organizations to protect vulnerable marine ecosystems, ensure sustainable fisheries, to prevent significant adverse impacts, including through prior impact assessments, adoption of measures to prevent significant adverse impacts, and a carrot, not to authorize fishing to proceed. Well, some may look at this as a stick, but it does indeed limit access to those who are willing to play by the rules. Matt Gianni will be first to say that there have been deficits in implementation. It's not consistent across a regional scale, but if you want a model, you can look to the Southern Ocean Commission on Conservation of Antarctic Living Marine Resources. Moving on, we also need to condition access. One of the most effective tools we discovered in the implementation of the high seas, deep seas, bottom fishing rev resolutions was the, was the obligation to report back to the United Nations, a global body, on what states and regional fisheries management organizations have done to implement this global commitment or requirement. We don't have a conference of parties for the Law of the Sea Convention that deals with substantive issues right now. There's no process to take decisions to modernize or to um, adopt marine protected areas. So we need some global overarching body that is supervising, assisting, and prompting compliance where we can. And of course, as I said, we need to trust, allow the good actors out there, but we also need the technological means to verify. We have a um, huge number of tools, technologies. Um, Elliot Norse's organization did a beautiful study in 2010. I'm happy to say that these have even been upgraded since then. Torsten Tila in the room here is an expert on many of these, and there are other people in the room too who would be happy to describe how you can apply these tools to make your eyes in the sky, in the sea, and on the seabed much more effective um, operationally. So in closing, I think we have the tools we need to ensure the biodiversity, maintenance, the conservation and uh, protection of health, resilience, and um, productivity of our oceans beyond national jurisdiction. But we do need the three major ingredients of shared responsibility, conditioning access, as well as effective enforcement. And I'll just give a plug for the addressing equity issues as well, something I did not have time to go into. But um, what was said earlier today about marine genetic resources and capacity development truly needs to be part and parcel of these discussions. So finally, I'll just say, in my mind at least, it is clear that a legally binding agreement to update and modernize the Law of the Sea Convention is indeed the way to go. But as also always, it's not the only way to go now because we've been hearing all morning about the crisis in and on and under the water. 
So in terms of what the European Ocean Alliance can do, what we can do through transatlantic cooperation, we can start to implement these elements I've already outlined. So thank you very much. been going on there if anybody is interested later. Thank you so much.